All right. Sorry. I starting one minute late. Okay. Welcome to the final lecture of the course. I hope you have uh, enjoyed the course so far. Um, in this final lecture, I'm going to continue the topic that I started yesterday, uh, which was about ticking clocks in quantum theory. And yesterday I went a lot through how we would model the structure and the dynamics of such a ticking clock. And so today I would like to give you a glimpse of how we use this uh, modeling and structure that uh, that we developed yesterday and well, that has been developed for let's say the last six or seven years or so. And I'm going to talk about a result that bounds the precision of, of quantum clocks. Specifically, it bounds the precision of clocks depending on how large their state space is. So in the description of clocks yesterday, um, I reviewed the fact that in the end, you have a model of something we call a clockwork and something you call a register. The register stores the number of ticks that have been seen. And the clockwork is this internal dynamics that causes the register to move. And so the properties of the clockwork are what make a clock good. So we saw yesterday with, if you don't take a clockwork at all, you get a Poisson process, which is somehow the, the trivial clock in some sense. And in the tutorial, you will have seen that um, if you take a higher dimensional ladder clock, you essentially increase the precision by exactly the number of states in that ladder. So now what I would like to do is to derive an upper bound uh, on the precision of clocks, depending on their size, using a technique that is really straight out of quantum information. Okay, so to start with, I'm going to say that we're going to deal today with only elementary reset clocks. So these are the simplest uh, varieties of them. These have the following properties. At time t is equal to zero, I can assume that I have um, a state eta and the register is in the state zero. So no ticks have been seen. The dynamics of the clock and register are given by the Limbladen I wrote down yesterday. So it's some internal Hamiltonian just on the clockwork. Then there is a dissipator that's also only on the clockwork. It does nothing to the register. And then there's a dissipator formed out of the, um, the operators, something on the clockwork tensor raising of the register. So this is a dissipator responsible for moving the register up by one. And the final thing to mention is that because it's a reset clock, we have the assumption that after any, any time the clock ticks, this Um, and what that means is that each of these states alone have traced less than one because the sum of all of them will be a normalized state. And also what it means is that if I was to measure the register at any time, the probability of getting the value n would of course just be the trace of this state. So the probability p of n given t is trace of the row, the state of the clock and the register at time t with the measurement operator, which is identity on the clock, and n on the register. So if I take this operation, of course, I'm going to isolate only that term, and then I take the trace of that. So this is just trace of rho n of t. Okay. So an alternate description of the clock is in terms of these, let's say, clockwork states. And the nice thing is that we can also write the evolution of the clock in terms of those clockwork states rather than on the full clock and register. So what I do is the following. I have, I write down the Limbladen equation. So I say d over dt of rho ct as a function of t is equal to, and now on the left-hand side, I just, I expand this into its general form. It's a mixture of states. So I'm going to get sum over n. I can take the differential inside. So I have d over dt rho of n t tensored n n, okay? So this is if I just apply just d over dt times that form. 
And then on the other hand, I also have that the Limbladian, uh, the D over DT of rho is the Limbladian. So it is L acting on this state, sum over N, rho of N, T, tensor, and N. Okay. And now what I do is the Limbladian is a linear operator. So I can take each of the terms in the Limbladian and I can apply it to, to the terms uh, inside here. And what I see is that the Limbladian has two types of terms. Essentially, the first type is the one that does not change the register. So this does not change the register because it's identity. This one does not, this one does not. And in the last line, this one changes the register, but this one does not because it's identity on the register. So what I can do is I can write this in the following manner. I can write it as sum over n, L not, L not acting on rho n of p, tensor the identity um, acting on n, so identity on both sides, plus sum over n, L plus acting on rho n of t with the gamma operators on both sides. So the gamma t, n, n, gamma t dagger. And what are L not and L1, uh, L not and L plus rather, they are exactly those operators there. So L not acting on rho. And now what's important here is that L not and L plus these are operators only upon the clock. So what I've done there is in each of those terms, I've separated the part that acts on the clock in the register. So L naught on rho is just minus I H rho minus, so plus sum over K, L K rho L K dagger minus half L K dagger L K rho. And finally, the one other term that adds is minus sum over J half of J, J, dagger, J, J, comma, rho. Because every one of these terms in the original Limbladian is tensored with identity on the register. So you see, I've just put them all in here, tensor identity on the register. And L plus is the only thing that generates a tick on the register, which is sum over J, 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 rho, J, J, dagger. Is the step clear? Okay, right. And importantly, the action of gamma t n gamma t dagger, this is just the state n plus one, n plus one, because gamma is a raising operator. Okay, so that's a diversion. So I continue this equation here. So this, uh, very good, yeah. So now I can, this, this equation, actually, this line is in a good form. This line, I can simply re relabel n plus one as n. And then I have to be careful about the, the limits. So this is all zero to infinity, zero to infinity, zero to infinity, zero to infinity. The reason I have zero to infinity is because I started with the register having zero ticks and it can only go forward. So I can only have n being zero or larger. So I write this now as sum n is equal to zero, n not, uh, n not of rho n of t, n n plus sum from n is equal to one to infinity of L plus rho n minus one of t tensor n n. So this is just re relabeling n plus one by n. So then this becomes n minus one and this starts from one to infinity. Okay, now I have two parts of this equation. So I have, this is my LHS is this one and my right-hand side is this one here. So now I can just look at the equations and I see um, I can, Clearly, everything that is uh, associated with one state of the register has to equate. So I actually have n, uh, um, an infinite set of equations, one for each n. And each of those equations is of this form, d over dt of rho n p is L naught rho 
n of t plus l plus um, rho n minus one of t. Okay. Which, now that we have the final form, is also intuitively clear. What we've done here when we've written these clockwork states is we've, we've written a chain of states. So I can write this as rho n of t, rho n, sorry, not a subscript, n, n plus one of t, rho n minus one of t, and so on and so forth. And what we're basically saying is the action of L naught takes you from a state to itself. Whereas the action of, should have done that in another color, sorry about that. The action of L plus takes you from one state to the next. So the rate of change of a state is given by this, which we call the non-tick generator. acting on the same thing, plus the tick generator acting on the previous state in the sequence. Okay. Now, oh, uh, one of the things I should say, sorry. So this equation is the equation I get for anything from n is equal to one to infinity, because I have uh, this term as well as that term. But for n is equal to zero, there is this one less term, For well, the case of n is equal to zero, the second thing does not contribute because uh, that only starts from one. So you have d over dt of rho zero of t is just L naught acting on rho zero of t, which again makes sense. You cannot have something, you cannot have the tick generator L plus feeding into the state because you start from zero. There's no minus one ticks. Okay. And this is important because we wanted to characterize the information or the precision of the tick of a reset clock. And we, re we know that because it's an elementary reset clock, just a single tick is sufficient to characterize everything. So in, in, in particular, the first tick is sufficient to characterize everything. So how do I write down the, the properties of the first tick? Well, this probability, so P of zero given T, I'm going to call this Q of t. The reason I call this Q of t is the probability of not having seen any tick at time t is essentially the same as the probability of not having ticked until that time. Because I start from zero ticks. So if at time t, I haven't seen any ticks, that means that is the probability of not having seen a tick until that time. So this is called by many things. You can also call it the survival probability. So if not having ticked until t. Um, okay, And this, another way of writing it is this is also one minus the cumulative probability. So this is one minus the cumulative probability of a tick. So this is the, by the cumulative property of a tick, I mean the total property that you have seen a tick. So of course, this is just one minus the other, the property that you have or the property that you haven't. And importantly, omega of t, which is the probability density function of seeing a tick, this is basically the der derivative of this cumulative property. So it's the rate of change of the total property that you see, have seen a tick, which is negative of that. So it's minus d over dt of Q of t, which is minus e over dt of rho zero of t. That's in turn minus d over dt of trace of this quantity. Because remember, p of zero given t is just a trace of this state. Uh, 
and uh, okay, so rho, rho zero given t. And the important thing is that this equation here has a very simple solution. If I have the rate of change of anything is given by a, an operator times that, this is actually the same as in standard uh, differential equations, rho of zero of t, then it's just the exponent of that operator times t acting on rho zero at time t is equal to zero, which is of course just eta, the starting state. Okay. Okay. So all of this is to say that essentially this, this operator e to the L naught t is very important because this acting on initial state gives you basically the, the subnormalized state corresponding to not having seen a tick. And the trace of that is, is your probability. And then the differential, everything else you want to uh, understand, such as the cumulative property or the density, you can get from that. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Yes? Yes, the Limbladian is time independent. So if you write it as the time order thing, everything is just L naught in a small quantity. So yeah, it all commutes. Okay. So now, now what I would like you to consider is a discretization of this setup. And what do I mean by discretization? What we're going to do is imagine that I write down the time axis. Instead of considering continuous time, what we're going to do is we're going to break it up into intervals of size delta. And I'm going to ask what happens in an interval of delta. Okay. And my main question here is I, I really want to understand the transformations on the clock and the ticking probability every step size delta. So for instance, let me consider that I start out um, with the state with the state eta, tensor zero zero on the register, and then I evolve it for delta. What's going to happen? Well, I know that when I evolve it, this is going to go into a mixture of states corresponding to different amounts of ticks, and what I would like to do is I would just like to separate two different parts of this, one corresponding to no ticks and another corresponding to one or more ticks, it doesn't matter. And the part corresponding to no ticks, I know what this form is. This is just e to the L naught delta times eta tensor zero, zero. And then here I have something else. Um, I have a sum over N of different things. But if I was to trace it out, so now I would like to, so at this point here, I trace out the register. So I'm only looking at the transformation on the clock alone. Then this is just e to the L naught delta acting on the state, eta. And here I will get the remainder of the map. Now, if I have the clockwork alone and I consider without the register what the dynamics are, it's simply going to be the total dynamics. So I know that if I trace out the register, I get for some of the dynamics, I get L, L naught, and for the other dynamics, I get L plus. So the total map is just going to be L naught plus L plus. So I've, I've erased the total in blood in, unfortunately, so I cannot point it out there. But if you were to take the total in blood in and trace out the effect of the register, you're going to get all of the clockwork terms, which are, well, L, all of the terms written in L naught and L plus. So essentially, the total map acting is the exponent of L naught plus L plus, and one of the branches has just the exponent of L naught, so the remainder branch will just be the difference. So it's L naught plus L plus delta, which is the total map, minus e to the L naught delta, and this acting on eta. Okay. One thing that it's worth seeing is that if delta is small, this gives a little bit of an intuition on this, a small delta, and you were to expand these, then what you get is, if you expand e to the L naught delta, you get identity plus L naught delta. And if you were to expand 
this one here, the identity terms would cancel, and the only thing that remains is L plus delta. Of course, you have a something that's order of delta squared in both. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the, the problem is that this, this map incorporates at least one tick, but it incorporates multiples of ticks as well. So when I write it in the form of sum over different ends, then each one of those will, will be complicated operators. But I know that if I trace out the register to just get the clockwork alone in that space, then I know that that, that full object must have this, this property. Yeah. If I was to now put back all the register states, then, then this operator would split into various different operators corresponding to one tick two ticks, three ticks, and that's, that's a much more complicated expression. But just for at least one tick, that is the one. Yeah. And the reason we can conclude that is because we know this one here. So we know what happens for no ticks. So we know that the remainder has to just be the full map minus this. Yes. Well, you could write it as a sum of exactly one, exactly two, exactly three, all the way to exactly infinity. And that would be. Well, yes, n is the number of ticks. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, sorry, this would be, I can write it as tensor and n and some things here as uh, some, well, there would be rho n delta effectively. Yeah. And indeed, writing each one of these is a complicated thing, but the sum of them all together over n, when I trace it out, just gives me that. Yeah. Okay, now, um, in fact, Yes, so. Okay, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce a map which I build out of, of that transformation, which is not really the physical thing that happens with the clock. It's an abstraction, but it's a useful abstraction because we're going to use a technique then from information theory that relies upon it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those two maps. I'm going to label them as, um, let's call this N is E to the L naught delta and T, but curly T is the rest, so E to the L naught plus L plus delta minus E to the L naught delta. And I call them N and T precisely because I, this is the no tick map and this is the tick map. And then I'm going to write down a map now which acts on the clock and takes it to a joint system of clock and register that acts on any state rho and it does the following. It does n acting on rho, tensor zero of the register, so the register is just a qubit, plus t acting on rho, tensor one on the register. Okay. So what I've done here is I've, I've essentially taken an infinitesimal step where I act with the clock map on rho, and I know that rho branches into two parts, one depending on it uh, not having tipped and one uh, corresponding to it having been ticked. And now we write down that information on an explicit system. So we say there is actually a bit register that takes this information. If it didn't tick, the register is zero. If it ticked, the register is one, okay? And now I can, okay, so I, I have this. Now imagine that I started out with eta, okay, and I did this map on eta, but I did it uh, n, let's say, k times, or k minus k minus one times, or k times, let's say k times. Okay. 
And now when I say k times, what do I mean? So this map, of course, it takes just a clock and then it adds on a register to the clock. So every time I apply the map, I consider that I have a new register. So there are going to be k different bits. Each one of them will be uh, added at the next application of the map. So what's going to happen there? So in each step, I'm going to take on a bit register, which can take one of two values, and then the next thing, and the next thing, and one of two values, which means at the end, my Hilbert space, so my structure is going to be the clockwork with k such registers. And each register can be in a zero or one. So the number of possible uh, states of this whole sequence of register is the number of possible bit strings. So it's two to the k. Okay. And I'm going to write this now in the following form. So I have two parts of it. So um, this the first part is going to be n acting k times on, sorry, on eta tensored. And this part, so each time I have a zero, I have an n. So the, the, time, the, the part of the state that has just n acting k times. So every single time I acted it, I acted on it by, with n. This is just going to be 0, 0, k times. And then I have the rest. So I have plus sum over all of the bit strings. Let's say sum over all x, where x is a sum bit string uh, of length k of some states here. So I, I don't really need them. So I just call them theta, theta x tensored the, um, the x state of the registers. So I'll call it x of the registers. Okay. Now, this is, this is very vague notation, because, uh, and the reason is because I don't really care about what happens, what is the exact form of these states. The important thing is to note that I've separated out the one part that just corresponded to not a tick every single time, and then the part that corresponded to at least one tick or maybe two. It doesn't matter how many of them. OK, so I can do this. Uh, yes? Uh, not, yeah, I'm sorry. Tense is not the, maybe this is the correct way to write it. It's the composition of the map k times. So n composed with itself k times. OK. Very good. Um, nice. OK, so now, using this form, I want to do the following. So the first time I introduced the waiting time distribution, I defined it as a negative, uh, the derivative of the cumulative probability. But this is in the continuous picture. Now I want to do it in the uh, discrete picture. So what I do is, is the following. So imagine that I've applied this k times. And then or let's say I apply this k minus 1 times. And then I apply it k times. Okay. And this is going to give me, so I'm going to write down now omega of k, which is the probability that the clock ticks for the first time in step k. Okay. And how do I find this? Well, it's very simple. I take at k minus 1 times, I'm going to have some form like this. One part, which is the clock hasn't ticked yet, and one part, which the clock has already ticked. So the part the clock has already ticked is not important to me. And then in the kth step, that one which has not ticked yet, itself is going to split into not having ticked and into having ticked. And that split into having ticked only at the k step, but not before that, is going to give me the probability that the clock ticks first time at step k. So essentially here, I'm going to get, so see, it's going to be omega k is equal to, so I take the part of the clock not having ticked until that time, which is n composed k minus 1 times acting on the initial state eta. And then at that point, I consider that it does tick, which is t, the ticking map, acting at that point, and then I trace it out there. Okay. Another way of saying this is this. This is essentially. Uh, let's see. I can also write this. Um, uh, maybe I write it in this fashion, and this is this may be simpler. 
this state here, I can actually split into one specific state, which is n acting k minus one times, and then t acting on eta tensored. And here I would have the state 0, 0, tensor k minus 1, and tensor 1, 1 on specifically the kth value of the register, and then plus the rest. You see? Yeah. Yeah. Is this clear? OK. So. Yeah. Okay, and so this is omega k. And the last thing now I want to define before I get to the proof is the following. So I want to call by rho uh, s the state of the clock after s steps given that it has not ticked yet. OK? And what is that? So again, if I have the state of the clock after k steps, then the part that corresponds to not having been having ticked is just going to be n acting k times on the initial state. So this is going to be is going to be proportional to n acting k times on the initial state. But now this is this is has to be normalized. So I take this to be a normalized state, which means that I have to now divide this by the probability, the trace of this same state. So I would divide it by trace of n acting k times on eta. But this has a particular significance here, because uh, this is essentially the probability that the clock hasn't ticked yet. So this is n acting k times on eta divided by q of k. So this I label the same way as q there. It's the survival probability probability after k steps. Oh, sorry, not k. Sorry, I was doing s. So I should write this all as s. I mean, OK, I could. Yeah, OK. I'll let, easier would just be to replace the k here. Sorry. No. K steps. All right. Okay. Why did it why did I define that state for a particular reason? So I have omega of k, which I'm actually now going to call omega subscript zero of k for reasons that will become apparent. And this is the, the waiting time, the waiting time distribution starting from eta, which is the initial state. But now I want to define the following. I want to define omega s of k, which is the waiting time distribution. But you start, instead of starting from eta, I start from this row, uh, row s in this case. Okay. So remember, eta by this definition of rho k, eta is by definition rho zero. It's the it's a state after zero steps. Given well, it doesn't matter. It's a state after zero steps. And I want to define omega s as everything, but you start from s instead of uh, the initial one. And now I can just calculate what this is. 
So omega s of k by the same uh, the same logic there is trace of t n applied k times, but now you apply it on row s instead. But row s has a particular form. Row s is n k times, so this is now n sorry n s times, so n k then n s times acting on eta divided by q of s. And this now I can just combine this n k and n s is n k plus s acting on eta. But that is now the definition of the original waiting time. Just with, so it's omega naught of k plus s divided by q of s. Okay. Now, at the moment, this is a formula, but let me give you a bit of intuition as to why this is. This is essentially what happens when you eliminate some outcome. So as an analogy, imagine that I give you a six-sided die, and I throw the die and I ask you, what's the probability of any of the numbers? Well, the answer is going to be one over six. But now imagine I say, okay, I throw the die, but I tell you the answer is definitely not four. I've seen it, and the answer is not four. What is the probability that of, of getting any of the other numbers? Well, you're going to say now it's one over five because there are five numbers left. So what you've done is you've essentially taken the original property distribution, you've eliminated the ones that you know are not going to happen, you've put them to zero, and the rest of the property you've renormalized exactly by the total that remains. And this is what we do when we do omega naught k plus s upon qs. What we've done is, so when we divide this, this thing, so I, I will draw a, a continuous function, but it's actually a, a sample of this function. So it's each of the omegas are essentially the areas in each of these uh, in these intervals. But now I tell you, actually, I start from s. So imagine that s is here. So then what you do to update the you to update the property distribution, I've told you that before s, no tick happened. So now you say, well, knowing this, I set all of this to zero. And the remainder, I have to renormalize. So I have to divide by the total probability under this curve, which is like exactly the same as the total property that I did not tick in this place. So it's one of them is one minus the other. And this is exactly this expression. It's the, sh it's the shifted, it's um, the original probability distribution, but instead you started at s, and now you have to divide by the probability that you actually could get to s without having seen a tick. Okay. So now, okay. And so the final thing now to say is, so imagine that I started with any of this um, row s's, and I apply this map that I talked about at the top. I apply it essentially an infinite number of times. Okay. So then I'm going to get, well, I'm going to get a mixture of all of the infinite bit strings. So infinite bit strings of row, let's, let's call this theta corresponding to x, tensor Rx. Well, what I do now is within this, first of all, I trace out, trace out the clock. Um, and so I'm going to get some over some probabilities, let me call this Qx tensor Rx, not tensor, sorry, this is Qx Rx. So I trace out the clock part. So this is clock and this is register. And then within these, what I do is, I'm not really interested in all of the ticks after the first tick, I'm only interested in the first tick. So I take all of the bit strings, but I combine them depending on when the first tick was. So for example, if I have the tick sequence 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, so on, and I have 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and so on, I combine these two properties together because all I care about is where the first tick happened. So essentially I take all of these states, but I now reduce the state space size by post-processing this to the set of states where I call, let's say, T1 is equal to K. And this basically is, this notation means the first tick was at K. Okay? And so then, so I do this, this step here, um, and I will get the sum over the probability that the first tick was at k, which is by definition, if I start from row s, it's omega k plus omega of k plus s upon 
Q of S with this state T R T one is equal to K. So this is just a reduction in this huge bit string information where I only care about the first state. Okay, and now in four minutes, I write down the proof. This should be sufficient. It's not. Okay, so now we come to the to the bound. So imagine that I start with a mixture of such states. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this following classical quantum state. And the state is the following. I have the sum over S, some probability distribution Cs. So this is a probability over S. I use some dummy classical system to just label all of these. So this is just going to be, let's call this system B, tensored rho S, okay? Now this is not a real object, it's just an math, uh, abstract mathematical object. I have a classical quantum state that corresponding to every S of the classical system. I have the state of the clock uh, after S steps given that it hasn't ticked. And then I do the same, I apply the map in infinite num number of times, after which I trace out the clock and I post process process to get just the states of the register T1 is equal to K. And what will I get here? So the first step doing M infinity, rho S will just turn into that, uh, that state over there. Actually, all, in all three steps, this is what I'm going to get. Uh, rho s is simply going to turn into that, and then the clock part is going to disappear. So at the end of this, I'm going to get the state sum over s, c s, 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 b, tensored sum over k, going from zero to infinity. I didn't write these before, but those are the limits. Omega of k plus s upon q of s t1 is equal to k, yeah. okay? Now, here's a very important part of the, of the argument. Take that the Hilbert space of the clock is of size d, so it's equal to complex space of size d. Then in that case, the mutual information of this state, so the mutual information i, of this system B and the clock is less or equal to log of B. I'm not sure you've already seen this in the QIT course, but, but this is just a standard statement in quantum information, so I'm not gonna uh, prove it. Okay, also the mutual information has a property that the mutual information between two systems cannot increase if you only act upon one of the systems because you, you're not doing anything which correlates the two systems together. And every one of these operations has that property. So with M infinity, I only act on the clock part. And of course I put in registers there, but the mutual information between this classical uh, dummy system and the rest is still going to be bound by log D. When I trace out the clock, this is also not going to change. And post-processing on, on um, just on the register is also not going to change the mutual information between this dummy variable and the register uh, of the system, which means the mutual information of this final thing between B and T1, is also going to be upper bound by log of t. Okay, so here as well, i between b and let's say the value of t1 is less or equal to log of t. Now, one of the ways of writing the mutual information, as you know, so i of x y is h of x minus h of x given y. But these are just the normal entropies. So I can do this here, and I'm going to use x by x, I'm going to mean the probability distribution of where I got the first tick, and by y, I'm going to mean the classical register. And so what this means now is I can do two things. What is the entropy of, um, 
the entropy of x given y first, let me do. So if I'm given the value of the register, then I know exactly what, um, which, which of the classical states I'm in. So I know the value of s. So I get one of these distributions. So I get the entropy of this distribution. And of course, h of x given y, I have to normalize by the property distribution y. So I have that sum over s, cs of the entropy of this thing, omega k plus s upon q of s. That is my h of x given y. And h of x, which is the entropy of just the, the register of when the first tick happened, this is going to be gotten by averaging, by basically tracing out the state of the other variables. So h of x means I trace out y. So I trace out this part. And so then I get, in that part, I get the entropy sum over s. And now I have the entropy, but this is now entropy of the average. So it's entropy of, sorry, the h is on the outside. It's h of sum over s, cs omega of k plus s upon q of s. And this whole thing is less or equal to log of t. Now, just to end it, what have I done? I've essentially taken a discrete version of any waiting time distribution. So I have a waiting time distribution that I generate from a d-dimensional clockwork. And I have some discretization of it, of whatever step size I want. I can choose the step size as I like. And then I could consider truncated versions of this waiting time. So instead of starting at t is equal to 0, I start at t is equal to, well, s times delta. And then I have the, the truncated waiting time, which is, of course, normalized. I can have any set of such truncations with any probability. So the c here is completely arbitrary. But for any such set and any probability distribution over them, I have that the entropy, the average of the entropy minus the entropy of the average thing that I get by adding all of these truncations together is less or equal to log of t. And the reason this is useful is one of the ways of turning this into a, into a notion of information or precision was done in yesterday's tutorial. So I can't go into very much detail because the time is up. But for example, if you were to take a waiting time that was a pulse, you could do this calculation by shifting the pulse with respect to itself. And the entropy of each of those things would be uh, a, essentially the entropy of the original pulse, because when you shift it or truncate it, until you hit 0, the pulse does not change at all. But the entropy of the average would be a uniform pulse from 0 all the way there. So it would be a much higher number. And so you see then that this number becomes much larger, depending on how thin the pulse is and the number of times you can shift it. And so the greater this number, the greater log of d, the greater this number, which means the sharper you can get a get a pulse to be. So this is something I cannot explain, but that would be the that was the point of the one of the tutorial questions yesterday. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, so it didn't, the, the size of the discretization doesn't matter. So I can take the limit where the discretization goes to zero. And, and then I would get a statement on the continuous, continuous time as well. So the, the discretization is really only to make it able to, um, to sort of fit in this, this proof method more than, more than actually being a fundamental way of, uh, of understanding the dynamics of the clock. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Um, yes, yeah, so I think I will answer more questions maybe outside if you have any, because I'll, I'll wrap up the lecture here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.